You're listening to the Armchair Cricket Podcast. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Armchair Cricket Podcast, a podcast focusing on test cricket by armchair critics of the game. In this episode, we continue a World Cup Digest where we cover latest matches and uh, news. Today, we'll be talking about the second match that was played in this World Cup uh, at Trent Bridge, Nottingham, between Pakistan and West Indies. Now, without further ado, let me welcome my co host, Ajit. Hello, Ajit. How are you doing? Hi, Giri. I had a nice uh, day out. It was a uh, good weather. And uh, unfortunately, I did not come home in time to catch the match at all. Uh-huh. So, you know, there was I m- not much understood. Of it. Yeah. Huh? There was not much of it anyway. Uh, the match was not long enough. Uh, I don't think you would have uh, been able to cover it. Uh, it, it was over uh, before. Yeah. <laughs> before. Right. Uh, well ahead of time. Yeah. Indeed. Mm-hmm. So, would you like to take us through the match today, Giri? Yeah, sure. So, Pakistan played against West, against West Indies at Trent Bridge. Um, West Indies won the toss and decided to bowl first. Um, Pakistan, you know, uh, were up against, I think, one of the better bowling uh, sides that we have come to see. In, uh, at least in the last few months, they've been, uh, West Indies mm-hmm. have been on the way up, like we saw in the Test Series against England. And this was no different. Uh, West Indies bowling lineup was packed with uh, firepower, you know, of the likes of um, uh, O'Shane Thomas, um, you know, Andrew Russell, Carlos Brathwaite, Cottrell, Mm -hmm. all these guys. So Pakistan were up against it uh, from the word go. Uh, Imam Ul-Haq and Fakhar Zaman came out to bat. Uh, Imam Ul-Haq was, you know, kind of... uh, uh, a fortunate dismissal, uh, I would say, mm. for West Indies. Uh, he was caught down the leg side uh, by right. the keeper uh, for mm-hmm. two runs. Uh, and Babar Azam and uh, Fakhar Zaman put on a l- small partnership, I would say about 20-odd runs, maybe no, 18, mm-hmm. 20 runs. And Babar Azam looked good. Fakhar Zaman also played some uh, attractive mm. shots. Uh, but in came, uh, uh, you know, Andre Russell, um, the big you know, powerful, uh, fast bowling mm. all-rounder. And when he came out to bowl, he started uh, you know, bowling some short pitch deliveries at mm. these batsmen, and he tested them with a few of them. Uh, <laughs> Fakhar Zaman, I think he was completely caught off guard, off guard like uh, it happened with uh, Hashim mm. Abdullah yesterday. Um, one of Dre Ras' sponsors uh, hit him oh. right on the lid. In fact, in between... Uh, uh, I would say almost in the gap, just about the grill, and uh, just beneath uh, the, <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, it must have hurt him, uh, I think, or he, he was a bit jaded, I think. He just turned over and then the ball uh, ricocheted off his uh, body onto the stumps and he was bowled, I think. That was uh, Andre Russell and the West Indian bowlers making a statement of what mm-hmm. was to come. Um, Babar Azam was looking good. He played some attractive shots. Uh, he, he played a couple of boundaries against O'Shane Thomas until he nicked one right. to the keeper. Um, and he was out for 22. Uh, Fakhar Zaman was also mm-hmm. out for 22. And then started the parade. Oh. Um, Harry Sohail was tested by short pitch deliveries again. Russell, he was caught behind. Um, Sarfraz Ahmad, I think he was caught down the leg side. Another fortuitous dismissal. Uh, but this was for uh, Jason mm-hmm. Holder. Mohammad Hafiz tried to hold the innings together uh, in the lower middle order, but I think he was also tested by one uh, another bouncer from O'Shane Thomas, and uh, Hafiz had no clue. He just took his eyes off the ball, tried to fend it away, and then the ball went to uh, fine leg for an easy catch uh, by mm-hmm. Cottrell. He was out for 16, and then, yeah, there was nothing left in the Pakistani side. Imad Wasim was out trying to take... Uh, yeah, trying to play against uh, a holder's delivery, which was going across him, it was caught by uh, Chris Gale fantastically well in the first slip. He had to right. move a bit. He stretched his body. I think there was a bit of an effort from the, from mm-hmm. the big cat. Um, and uh, Shadab Khan was out. Plum, LBW, O'Shane Thomas, Hassan Ali was out for one run. 
uh, and Wahabria's entertained with a couple of uh, sixes and a four right. towards the end. Uh, but in the end, this was not enough. And Pakistani batting had a calamitous collapse. Uh, this was, yeah, this was a really disappointing performance from them. In the end, they were all out for 105 mm-hmm. runs. Um, in amongst the wickets were almost all the bowlers except for uh, Carlos Brathwaite, who I must say was a bit unfortunate because uh, Babarazam had hit uh, a ball straight to a right, short point right. uh, where Hetmeyer was fielding and then he, he popped, the ball popped out right. of his hands. Otherwise, he would have also had a wicket. Cottrell picked up a wicket uh, for 18 runs in his four overs. Jason Holder picked up three wickets. He was a mm. bit expensive because he opened the bowling with Cottrell and uh, Fakhar Zaman and Babar, Babar Azam were going well at that point. So he picked up three wickets for 42 runs. Um, Andre Russell uh, had a miserly spell. Three overs, one made in four runs and two mm-hmm. wickets. A lot of short pitch deliveries. He just bowled 12 right. balls. Can you wow. imagine that? And he made such an impact. I think he was a game changer there at the top of the order. Indeed. And uh, O'Shea Thomas, um, he picked up four wickets for 27 runs, bowled with a lot of venom mm. and pace, um, like Joe Fra- right. Archer did uh, a couple, uh, yesterday, mm-hmm. in fact. Um, so he bowled well. So that was the Pakistan, uh, West Indian right. bowling card. West Indies, uh, yeah, they, they made merry. Uh, Chris Gale uh, took uh, Pakistani bowlers to the cleaners. Uh, he made 50 runs, a quick five, 50 in 34 mm. deliveries, four sixes and three, uh, four fours and uh, right. three sixes until he was uh, dismissed by Mohammad Amir uh, while trying to pull a ball. I think he was not there to be pulled. He was probably beaten for pace mm. or something. Uh, Shehob looked a bit patchy, but he, he got out for 11 runs. But, you know, 105 runs was absolutely, I, I think it was not Indeed. enough. Um, and Wayne Bravo was out for a duck. I think you have something to, something to say about Wayne Bravo uh, a little yeah. bit later. Uh, he was out for a duck, another mm-hmm. failure. Um, until uh, Nicholas Puran and uh, Shimron Hetmeyer guided them safely right. home. Nicholas Puran looked very good. Uh, I saw him even play, you know, uh, a pull down the ground over long on uh, against the pace of mm. Wahab Riyas. And Wahab Riyas bowls really fast. He's 88, he was in 88 or 89 miles per hour, the delivery. So he was looking good. Um, all in all, West Indies uh, finished the job as it was required uh, in under 14 mm-hmm. overs. Um, Pakistani bowlers went for runs. Hassan Ali went for f- uh, 39 runs in his four overs. Wahab Riyas uh, went for 40 runs in his 3.4 overs. But the pick of the bowlers, if you can say that, was Muhammad right. Amir. And also a uh, return to form, I should say. He picked up three wickets for 26 runs in his uh, six mm-hmm. overs. So a little bit of a silver lining for the Pakistani Indeed. side there. Because Amir was not mm. looking good uh, leading up to this World Cup. Uh, now he seems to be okay. Um, for his four wickets uh, in the Pakistani batting innings, uh, Oshin Thomas was awarded the player mm-hmm. of the match. And I feel very happy when a, when a bowler you know, is awarded uh, the player right, of the match. Right, you know this. <laughs> you know, I am so much biased. I'm, <laughs> right. You know that about me. So West Indies start well. Uh, Pakistan have a lot of homework mm. to do. Um, yeah, I think there has been criticism from... Uh, all Pakistani fans, as well as the experts, panelists, everyone, about their inability to uh, handle short pitch mm. pulling. Uh, what is your take on this? Or, where, I mean, what happened? What happened to Pakistan? Well, I mean, yes, it does look like, you know, uh, even after the match, I think Sarfraz Ahmed credited uh, Dre Russ. And Dre Russell as being the, let's say, the game changer. His uh, really rapid spell sort of shook Pakistan a little bit. You know, you were right that, you know, Imam Ulhaq was out a bit unluckily. He was caught down the leg. He was not looking mm-hmm. particularly comfortable. I caught some highlights, actually. So, mm-hmm. I, this is what I'm going to contribute with. So, mm-hmm. he was not looking very comfortable and he was dismissed. But, you know, for me, the real turning point in the match is those 12 balls or whatever you said. Those really quick 12 balls that uh, Adreras was able to deliver in such a way that he really shook up Pakistani batters. So, yeah. first he dismissed Fakhar Zaman with a brute of a delivery that bowled him, let's say, off his helmet and then uh, probably left a bruise on Fakhar Zaman's head. And the other one was uh, the really brute of a ball that I think took off from a length 
for to Harris Sohail and it really went past yeah. his nose and he had yeah. no clue how, how to deal with that. And I think that was bold at 146 uh, kph. So, you know, I think he's uh, he can be rightly from now on called right arm fast rather than right arm fast. Rapid, medium. I would say right arm rapid. Right arm <laughs> rapid uh, or right arm very fast or whatever. Yeah. Right. So, indeed, and uh, this can be, I think the, those 12 balls really shook um, the Pakistani dressing room a bit and they were in a bit of a panic. Right. And the second turning point for me was really when Babar Azam got out. Right. They had reached 3 for 62, where Babar Azam and uh, Muhammad Hafiz had steadied the innings a little bit. And 3 for 62 in 13.1 uh, overs is not very bad. But that's when Babar Azam got out. And I thought his shot was a bit lazy because he was driving very far away from his body. And uh, he was the one batsman that looked comfortable against fast bowling. I think he played a couple of really solid pull shots. I think you were mentioning it to him off air as well. Uh, yeah. Or to me, I mean. That he was really um, looking comfortable. So, this was one, I think, another turning point as far as Pakistan was concerned. If they had rode out a 5 or an 8 or spell, gotten to, let's say, um, 80 for 3 in 18 overs or 100 for 3 in 22 overs or some such... I think you could have seen that, you know, they would have gotten to 250 plus or 280 or something. And this would have been a regular match. But that spell, those few four to five overs between Oshane Thomas and Andre Russell rip, uh, completely ripped the heart out of Pakistani batting. Uh, yeah. And I think um, when you look at some of those uh, statistics from this match, right? Uh, from a statistics perspective, the, this match has been uh, the worst defeat for Pakistan in a World Cup. So they have lost by 218 runs. And this is the, their second only worst defeat, if I may put it like that. That mm -hmm. uh, Earlier in 1993 against South Africa, they were all out for 43. And that match, they had lost by 225 balls. This one, they lost by 218 balls. right? Mm -hmm. And um, when you look at some of the other uh, you know, uh, records, or let's say ignominious records that Pakistan unfortunately mm -hmm. made today, one is that this is their second lowest World Cup score. They made 74 all out in the 1992 World Cup. Right, but then they went on and won that World Cup. But then, also another coincidence is that in their first match against West Indies, they suffered a terrible loss. In that tournament, I think they lost to West Indies by ten wickets in their very first match. Right. Right. I mean, this is also a round robin league, very much like that one. So you know, who knows how this will go? But maybe this is an ominous start as far as Pakistan is concerned because they need something to shake them out of a little bit of a rut they've gotten themselves into. They are on a eleven match ODI losing streak. Right, and this is this is their worst, um, let's say, ODI losing streak uh, so far. So they'll need something special to get them out of it, shake them out of it, and so on. So when we look at the short ball barrage that West Indians bowled, right, the chin music barrage, so to say. So they bowled 68 balls short of length, of which 55 balls, 55 runs were scored by Pakistan. That is not a bad thing, I would say. Mm -hmm. But there were seven wickets in between, right? And that meant they lost a wicket uh, at an average of 7.85 per wicket, runs per wicket, right? So that was a bit tough. Mm -hmm. And the other thing, you know, even somebody like Jason Holder, who's usually pitched the uh, ball up sort of a bowler who looks for swing or seam, right? This guy also bowled a couple of short balls. And he all was also successful on that, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, Oshin Thomas, who's probably the most feared, at least before this match in this lineup, when it mm -hmm. comes to pace and venom, he bowled only one sh wicket taking short ball, but three of his other wickets were actually hitting either much further or one was even almost a Yorker, the one where I think uh, he got the LBW, right? Yeah. So that was very interesting. This is some statistics from Pakistan perspective. But when you look at West Indies, this is only the second time they have been able to dismiss a team for 105 or less in a World Cup. So in 1996, they had bowled Sri Lanka out for um, 102. Uh, this is not a World Cup, but in the Benson and Hedges series. So, yeah. So, this is only the second time that they've actually bowled a team out for 105 or 105 or lower, right? That's one thing. Mm. The other thing, well, Chris Gale. So, you said he really took the chase off to a flying start and so on because he really scored rapidly and put this match to bed pretty early on, right? Mm. So, this guy, he hit three sixes in this innings and by doing that, he now is the single uh, highest six hitter in World Cup history. So, he now has 40 sixes, right? And previously, before this World Cup began, he was tied at 37 with a certain A.B. de Villiers, right? Ah. Uh, at the end of 2015 World Cup, both of these had uh, 37 sixes apiece, right? Mm -hmm. And now he moves clearly to the top of that board. And uh, Ricky Ponting, interestingly, is number three on that board. He has hit 31 sixes in World Cups, right? Oh. Also, uh, by making a 50 in this match, Chris Gale now has a six 
a 50 plus score streak going so in this last six odis is at least at the 50 or more right and this is the joint second longest streak in history of odis so this is fantastic and in his last six innings gale has scored 547 runs and has hit 47 sixes but 47 sixes in six matches so that averages to almost eight per match and he only scored three in this one so you can imagine uh, the US boss is in some sort of a hot streak and I think he wants to finish on a high looking at how well West Indians have really uh, gelled together and how well they have been performing uh, I think we may have to revise uh, some of our you know statistics uh, when it comes to how they will fare as the World Cup goes on but you know uh, as they say one uh, swallow does not make a summer so let's see if they can repeat some of these you know heroics in the upcoming matches this is one thing the other rather unfortunate stat that Pakistan take away from this match is that they have a net run rate of minus 5.8 at the end of this match because they lost so by, uh, hugely, let's say. And West Indies therefore have a uh, net run rate of plus 5.8. This is ridiculous. If you look at yesterday's match, even though England and South Africa played out a fairly competitive match, but South Africa lost by more than 100 runs, that left South Africa's net run rate minus 2.08 and England's net run rate plus 2.08. If you compare to that, in this one match, West Indies has a net run rate of 5.8. This is ridiculous. And so does Pakistan, who have a negative score. So yeah. uh, there's a lot uh, for Pakistan to come back on. And I think uh, this sort of uh, jolt, this sort of uh, you know loss will really shake them out of their lethargy, I think. Right? That's one thing. So the other thing also, I think uh, this tournament has ominously begun very much like the 1992 World Cup as far as Pakistan is concerned, right? Not only the similarity in format, but also mm -hmm. maybe heading into the tournament on a low and continuing on a low until, you know, you have no other choice but to win every game. And then, you know, they, they probably mm -hmm. like to back themselves to a corner just so that the victory at the end seems that much more uh, fantastic. So mm -hmm. <laughs> anybody who's watching this might want to watch a bit carefully. History does tend to repeat itself. So we don't know how this might go, right? Yeah, indeed. All right, that was that was a fantastic match in terms of if you're a fan of fast bowling because even Amir took three wickets and he was sort of you know struggling for a bit of form and he was the one guy who's probably placed in this fast bowling uh, lineup for Pakistan was a bit under cloud but he's come back well he took three wickets yeah. right all the three wickets to fall and mm -hmm. that 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 does good for him I think it gives him a bit of confidence going into this uh, next match I I think he touched 140 a couple of times I saw in his spell right. Mm -hmm. Okay. That also shows, you know, we were talking previously that his, he was down on pace. He was probably not yet completely recovered. Yeah. That seems to have turned around, right? Mm -hmm. That's an excellent. Uh, that's an excellent thing as far as Pakistan are concerned. The other thing I heard a couple of, uh, let's say, discussion shows on YouTube. Mm -hmm. One of those was caught behind. So shout out to those guys. And another was Rami speaks. I think so. In both of these, they were a bit harsh on Pakistani batters for not uh, standing up to short pitch bowling. Let me put it like this. And uh, one of the things that uh, I think uh, they also mentioned is that was Harris Sohail the right choice ahead of somebody like Asif Ali? Mm -hmm. This was another point they mentioned because they said by choosing somebody like Harris Sohail at four, you are sort of projecting a slightly defensive mindset. I think they were a bit harsh, but they may have a point. Uh, they want somebody like Hafiz to bat at four, Sarfaz Ahmed to bat at four or five, mm -hmm. right? Depending on the match situation and somebody like Asif Ali to come in at six ahead of the likes of Ami Madhwasim and Shadab Khan, the, mm -hmm. let's say the spinning all-rounders. Mm -hmm. So that's their perspective, the caught behind show. And I think that that could be something to look at for Pakistan going ahead because it's a nine-match uh, group stage. I think they have some, um, let's say, some inputs there and that might still be worth it, mm -hmm. right? Um, so all in all, it was a one-sided match, but I think uh, West Indies will take a lot of confidence going forward. Right, Kiri? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think West Indies have started off well. Mm. Um you never know. I think that they might actually be, uh, they might actually emerge as one of the stronger teams here. We may not have given them a lot of uh, chance in our predictions earlier uh, in our previews. Mm. Uh, but let's see. I mean, we're going to keep our fingers crossed. One additional thing I want to point out here is that uh, Dre Ross looked a bit uncomfortable after his bowling spell. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he walked off w with a limp. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I read on Crick Info that uh, he has some form of arthritis, so it keeps and uh, it keeps coming and going. So it ah, should be okay for the next match. I see. I see. Yeah, wow. So okay. Fingers crossed, because he was looking hostile, and uh, we really like to see such fast bowlers. Indeed. Bowlers take control of the game once again. It's <laughs> too far too much stacked uh, in favor of the batsman. I'm afraid. Of course, of course. I mean, if you were to left you, you would want to see this in every game, won't you? 
Absolutely. Why not? Um, once in a while, maybe a 300 score, but not 400. 400 is... Uh, <laughs> I was half expecting England to do that yesterday, you know. Uh, they might score 400. <laughs> well, yes, you and a lot of us. Uh, I'll stick my neck out and I'll say it. So, I think we will see at least one 400 score before this tournament is done. And that might be in the initial stages because uh-huh. teams are a bit more free as the tension takes hold and the group stages come to an end and maybe the knockouts begin, probably you will not see that free Mm -hmm. style, Mm -hmm. free flow batting, right? But in the initial, let's say, two weeks of the tournament, there is a very high likelihood you might see a 400 score. But let's see. I mean, I might be proved wrong as well, right? All right. Uh, How about tomorrow's matches, Kiri? Yeah, the tomorrow is a double header, actually. So we have two matches on a Saturday. That's the 1st of June. Uh Uh, So the first one is played at Cardiff, Sophia Gardens. Uh, New Zealand play against Sri Mm -hmm. Lanka. That's a day game, so right. it's a 10.30 start, 10.30 uh, British mm. summer time. Uh, and the second right. one is at Bristol. Uh, this is played between Afghanistan and uh, Australia, and this is a day-nighter, so they start around 1.30 uh, in the afternoon, mm. local time. Right. So, two matches. Wow. That leaves a nice stagger for us. That basically means, you know, all you have to do is get up a little late and have a big breakfast, and then the rest of the day is covered, right? Yeah, you can uh, basically, you know, uh, put some glue <laughs> and then uh, sit on the couch, not get up. Right, right. Perfect. All right. Uh, well, I think uh, when we look at uh, tomorrow's uh, match, I think uh, Latham, who had missed Tom Latham, the New Zealand keeper who had missed the uh, first match due to injury, I think might be returning to the 11. So it will be interesting seeing that uh, you know Tom Lundell scored 100 previously. So mm. it will be interesting to see. In one of the practice matches, Tom Lundell did well. But let's see how that goes. Right? Yeah. All right. Now, if you were to look at the trivia question from yesterday's episode. So, the trivia question from yesterday's episode was, in 1999 World Cup, which were the countries that hosted the World Cup matches? So, there was a red herring here. And we did not get any right, any right answers. But I understand the turnaround time is very short. So, the obvious choices for holding matches, of course, considering it was hosted by England and Wales, Right, so it is England, Wales, Ireland, Scotland were the obvious choices, and they were right. But there was one red herring that was Netherlands. So Netherlands hosted one match, that was the match between South Africa and Kenya, that was held uh, approximately 20 years ago, let's say, on the 29th of May, 2000, uh, 1999, and this was held in Amstelveen, right? So uh, this match was in the VIP grounds. Is that your local ground? Well, you could call it my local ground. I don't live very far away from that. So yeah. Okay. Fantastic. So that was the, let's say, the red herring, the question that we wanted to answer, right? Now, going on, uh, if you were to look at the trivia question from today, the question is, what or who was the inspiration for the 1999 World Cup's logo? So this has a very interesting answer. Uh, if you were to look at the logo carefully, does it remind you of any individual or of any other thing? That is the clue I can give you. So we would be very curious to see if anybody out there can guess the answer right. Right? All right then. Going on, uh, we would like to thank our listeners and our supporters once again for uh, their loyal following and the comments that they send us. We request you to be more, uh, you know, uh, tactile with your feedback and write to us with whatever you think about our podcast. You could leave, uh, you know, comments and ratings for us. That will really help us with uh, taking our show forward. And whenever you give us a five-star review, it really gives us a good boost, be it on Apple Podcasts or Podbean or any other podcasting platform you listen to us. There are a bunch of these links in our uh, episode description, right? Also, please do subscribe to our podcast. Then you can get every uh, update from us directly in your uh, phone or in whichever tool you listen to your podcast and you can directly listen to us, right? We are available on social media and on Twitter. You can reach us at armchecktrickpod. You can visit us on our Facebook page, right? You could write into us at armchair.cricket at gmail.com and so on. And we would always request that, you know, if possible, if you think what we do is good, please talk about it with your cricket friends and maybe see if you can give us a shout out, right? All right. I think given that there will be a double header tomorrow, I think we'll have much to discuss, right, Kiri? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Right. All right, then. Uh, having said all that, it's a goodbye from me. And it's a goodbye from him. Bye-bye. You're listening to the Armchair Cricket Podcast.